right. Let me just pull up my information here. Uh, it doesn't matter if you haven't seen today's episode because I haven't. So uh, if you have, then you're leading this episode. Oh, okay. Okay. Brace yourself. Have I? Have I seen this? Okay. You're about to find out. The suspense always gets me with this thing. <laughs> Will I be ready? Can I handle it? I don't know. yourself into your seat because it's see for yourself the only podcast that shouts surprise when we mean to whisper hello i am your host endogenic sound and i am joined here today by shark tooth necklace aren't we all i i have a movie here for you today a shark tooth necklace i'm listening the name of the film is one crazy summer i don't think i've seen this one you lucky son of a bitch <laughs> Do you know something I don't know? Because to me, it just sounds like a regular, regular time. Like just a summer night sort of deal. This might be the most regular film we've ever watched. It's just being regular with us. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. I have also not seen it, and I'll, I'll go ahead and give you the blurb because uh, you know, one crazy summer doesn't really give us a whole lot to work with. So I'll just I'm thinking, hey, and... hold on, hey, I can be commit, I can be imaginative, <laughs> I can be creative, I can do it, I can, I can do be, it, I can try. <laughs> give me, give me, give me, give me some time to try. The one and only lead I have for this is the one with Adam Sandler. Oh gosh, come on, man. <laughs> I know this with Drew Drew Barrymore, and she's got amnesia. <laughs> fifth, and that happens. Fifty first dates. Is yes. It fifty first dates. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So I'm like, well, it could be a what crazy summer is finding out the love of your life doesn't remember you all over again. But this time, just um, why why not throw in some dude? Where's my car? Shenanigans on top of it. Just you, you can have crazy nights, is what I'm saying. That crazy can be how ridiculous the situation is. I'd hope, or it could be like the person you love, which is not not quite all there. I'm sorry, that wasn't <laughs> mental <laughs> illness. Uh, appropriate but <laughs> her crazy aspect is that she has a crippling mental health disease yeah 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 i did say that i'm so sorry <laughs> and by the way it's only one crazy summer so he either cures her or kills her by the end of it oh no 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 that is not what i am hoping for <laughs> There's a, this this title has a degree of finality to it that I don't think you're exactly comfortable with, with what you're uh, predicting. You know, now would be a good time for a blurb. Let, let's cut over that blurb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> The blurb reads as follows. A high school graduate fails to make it into art school by the deadline and now must occupy his time without college. Mm, I'm going to let you go first because I don't like where I just went. Oh, oh my. Okay, so it's got to be, he has to be doing something heinous. Like it has got to be something that you do one time and you're just like, oh my God, I had to do this this one time. And I'd like for it to be the thing that like ruins his deadline. Like he's unable to submit his work or, or or submitted the essay or whatever because this thing interrupts it and then he ends up doing that thing for the rest of summer until he can get in during uh the fall or next spring or whatever time he's able to get in so he's like being a mad scientist in his method about finishing his project on time i'm thinking more like it's like something out of his control like it's not his doing it's like he's he's working on his project and protesters like break into his house because they gotta like squat somewhere and he's like whoa i'm working on this thing and they're like shut up kid we, we gotta sit down here because we're we're protesting against and i i can't think of a thing that they would be protesting against maybe maybe the thing they're protesting against is like how poorly artists are treated <laughs> And he's like, no, being an artist is great. Like, I can't wait till I like, get into painting all of my stuff at college. And he's like, they're like, no, the corporate fucking douchebags, blah, blah, blah. And so that's what slows him down is like learning about these people and how they're fighting against like, you know, corporate greed and like the art sector. Then he's like, damn, now I don't even want to go to college and contribute to this shitty system. So I'm just going to keep fighting the good fight with these good guys. So he goes from wanting to like move up in the status quo way of graduating college to just making radical grassroots changes. Yeah. Yeah, like he actually like you know, he goes from being like rich kid his family's gonna send him off to this art college and everything to being like damn i didn't realize the system was so the only people who are gonna succeed in the art world are people who don't even make good art and all the people who make good art die sad and alone years later their stuff becomes popular and recognized for how good it was but not in time for them to make any money yeah and and then he's like you know fuck that i'm gonna be a great artist who suffers in the streets and and fights the good fight against capitalist pig fuckers 
I'm going to make it so that my my artistic future children don't have to struggle in the slums before they're recognized for their talent. Can you imagine people being like, I'm going to make the future better for my children? Can you imagine that? I can. I actually can. I cannot. I don't even know how that would, how would that even work? <laughs> Are you satisfied with your prediction? No, I think it's missing something. I could also see a situation where it's like, I would really love, I would love, love, love if he has like, uh, just like really bad ADHD basically, but they represent that as like, he has these super intense daydreams. The thing that stopped him from being able to submit his work is Godzilla has crashed in through his living room and he's got, and it's just Godzilla. And he's like, oh no, Godzilla, please. And he has to have like a full blown conversation with Godzilla until he cuts back to reality. And he's just talking to his dad about Godzilla for like 30 minutes and he's like son don't you have to be turning in your requests to get into art college here soon and he's like what oh yeah and so like we can't tell like the blur between reality and not like the transitions in this is like very smooth and seamless until the part where the person like brings him back to reality well I hope he has a happy ending with that because you know you could pretty easily give us a good ending and then be like but did it really happen you know this guy you know unlike most film goers i am not at all interested in a definitive answer one way or the other if you put a, the whole film in like a make-believe world and then you tell me that there's some serious stuff happening on the side but the make-believe stuff's happening to like distract me from it and then the ending happens and it's kind of ambiguous i don't care i don't care i got to see all these cool things <laughs> No, no, I, I don't want you to be punished for your ADHD. <laughs> I don't want your girlfriend to be vilified for being crazy. <laughs> I would like the message of the film to be that he didn't have to go to art school and that he was perfectly content and happy just like living in his make-believe world and using that to inspire his artistic decisions. Mm. I'd also add I would not be opposed if instead of art school he uh, he just was a successful stand-up comedian. Own your own brand. No, no grades. <laughs> This, so this movie came out in 1986, and I think that you and I have talked about this in the past, where there's like a almost limitless number of films where characters are like, instead of following his typical career, he went off and became a, like any number of things you can find a movie for it. Mm -hmm. But there are next to none of them where the characters like, instead of following my typical career path, I instead became a stand-up comedian. Yes. I do remember this. Even though that's a thing that happens, like people do do that. It's always like they, they start in the beginning to be a stand-up comedian and then, I don't know, their life gets better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if there's one thing poor people want to do to try to fix their shitty s s stance in life, it's go off and become a stand-up comedian. I mean, the last time I heard about a character being a stand-up comedian and changing course, that was the recent Joker film. <laughs> So what are we saying about the stand-up comedian world? Being a stand-up comedian turns you into a villain. <laughs> That's all it does. It's your turn now. It's your turn. Yeah. No, I don't want. I don't want. Okay. Uh, my first impression was this is code for young Hitler, who we know did not get into art school. Oh, no. no. <laughs> yes. This is, this is exactly the kind of prediction that this podcast was made for. No. I, I stand by the young Hitler prediction every no. time we get it. No. I was like, I don't want to hear about how he was just a regular high schooler, but he didn't get into art college. So he just, you know, found a way to live his life. And I'm like, I don't want to know. That is not the, that's not the message we should take from this biography. <laughs> <laughs> But it's okay because, you know, we're, we're, we're in the future, so we can make it satire, wink, wink, how easy it could be to just be one regular, artistic, loving high schooler that just didn't get into college. Art college. On the off chance that you're right, I'm going to check to see who the director is. And if it says Lenny Riefenstahl, <laughs> we're, uh, we're in for a bad time. Is it a comedy? Do we know this about this movie? The director's name is Savage Steve Holland. <laughs> I would trust that guy to direct a crazy movie. And it, it, it is a comedy. It is a comedy. Okay. Okay. I, um, I hope to laugh and not cringe the entire time because the guy that's unnamed the high schooler that we care about gets really close to identifying himself but never actually does you know anything please don't let that happen <laughs> don't make me watch a movie like that you heard didn't make it into into art school and male and you were like <laughs> yes Hitler, it's Hitler. <laughs> i was like who would make a regular why is it so important that it's art college <laughs> we all know we all know <laughs>
I think I traumatized you with everything is illuminated. Like I was like, oh, it's like a, it's like a comedy. It's it's supposed to be kind of fun. Everything's illuminated. It's kind of illuminated in the title. And you're like, oh, it was it was about the culling of a of an entire Jewish town by the the, the Nazi army. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, kind of a little bit. And then right after that, it's like, I'm going to tell you about Call to Zach. And I was like, I know about these art housey movies. I know of these highbrow comedies, these sophisticated academia movies where they just take something that's not at all threatening. And they're like, how can I make Shark Tooth Necklace feel not okay about anything in this film at all? And that's my fear is that I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to end up spending my life with a movie. And the whole thing that the movie is trying to give me is like, you used to think that this was a neutral thing, but now you know that it's an averse thing. Well, I am interested to see those sort of like art house, like highbrow kind of uh, uh, self-serious. No, I, I don't know what to, how to call, what to call them exactly. Yeah, we need a category for it so I can just start dumping titles. in <laughs> Head up their own ass type movies. Yes! Uh, while, I, while I am interested in head ass movies... <laughs> I don't want our podcast to be looked at that way exactly. <laughs> okay. And I and it's not like I'm like, oh man, we got to do all the Adam Sandler movies. I would, but like it seems like almost everybody's already seen all the Adam Sandler movies. Ah, uh, okay. So it's it's tough to like find somebody who's like, I haven't seen any of them. And I'm like, all right, well, you're going to be in the next nine podcast episodes. <laughs> I don't know if I wish that on somebody. <laughs> it's a very special kind of hell having to watch nine <laughs> Adam Sandler movies back to back and talk to and, and talk to me for an hour. That's the worst part of this, really. Like the Adam Sandler movies by themselves are fine. It's having to talk to me about them afterwards. Like that's the part that should be harrowing about this. I need to make sure that you digested what we both saw visually. Did 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 you see people uh, <clears throat> dressed as Native Americans? <laughs> How did you feel about that? How'd you feel? I, I don't know. I, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> I don't want to talk about that. What about the aspect of uh, Big Daddy where he like insults a woman over working at Hooters for like a third of the fucking movie? Oh, no. <laughs> no. But he never like acknowledges that like Hooters itself is uh, inherently predatory and like all these different things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's not what I'm looking forward to for see for yourself. No, I just like the part where he dressed up as a scuba guy and called himself Scuba Steve. I don't know. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> Yeah. This poor hypothetical uh, podcast member. Wherever you are, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Your destiny has been determined. That's gonna be you know what that's gonna be the thing that we get canceled over. It's gonna be like the first time that we have somebody who's like every single minority group possible in one <laughs> human person. No. And they're gonna be like dive tackled by me for not seeing the deeper meaning in <laughs> Deuce Bigelow, Male Gigolo, or whatever the fuck <laughs> movie. And uh <laughs> And, uh, and then the entire internet's going to descend on me like wild boars. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you attack that that Asian, that, that Afro-Asian... Don't, don't do this. Don't you do this. <laughs> don't, don't you go there. Transgender drag queen. Uh, <laughs> prostitute uh, stripper with an OnlyFans account. <laughs> one crazy summer. One crazy summer. Not two crazy summers. Just one. For, for levity, what if we get, like, the precursor for Phineas and Ferb? Go on. So, before Phineas and Ferb was animated, there was this movie, because it's in 1986, I think you said? Yes, it is. And uh, the high school achieving guy, hey, he didn't get into art school, and he's got a friend. They just decide to take their genius elsewhere, and they spend the entire summer building stuff that somehow gets disintegrated before their parents come home because they're teenagers still. <laughs> It's basically Phineas and Ferb, but it's live action and there hasn't been a Phineas and Ferb yet. There's no B-plot and um, there's no Sister to Tattletale and there's no Perry the Platypus. So you're saying that there is going to have like a, a trusty sidekick who will like take on all of these wacky adventures? I think so. Yeah. I don't know if they'll be as productive as things you can sell in a day. Like here's a theme park that we made or here's a beach that we brought to our backyard. But I do expect them to come across some at least creative ideas that you're like, wow, that would have been cool if this movie were more of a documentary. But, you know, that's the fun of the comedy. I hate doing this. And you know I hate doing this. But I feel I am obligated to at this point. But since you said it and you did say it. You said it out loud. Okay. You said that our character would have a cool sidekick. So, <laughs> do you think maybe, just maybe, this movie could be a buddy cop comedy? A buddy cop with 
to high schoolers. Hey, look, the buddy cop formula is wide and flexible, okay? I don't know buddy cop outside of cop, really. I think but because it's they they pair so well with the cop part. Well, I mean, I mean they could be like, you know, Scooby Doo style detectives for the one crazy summer. Uh, you know that that could happen, but something about facts and clues and logic that just it doesn't sit right with Shark Tooth Necklace. I want my creativity to be untethered. Don't be a murder mystery in my fun comedy about a crazy summer. <laughs> <laughs> is that too much to ask? I don't think that's I don't think that's a long shot. Well, that would add to the craziness because so far we haven't exactly stated anything too crazy, like other than daydreaming. Like dra daydreaming was the craziest thing I've come up with. And then coming up with some product that I can't come up with on the spot that is not going to be pursued for the rest of the movie was my second very in heavy quotation marks crazy thing. I still like the Hitler idea. <laughs> it it would be pretty like crazy. It. Don't like it. No. For one crazy summer, a little Adolf over here. For one crazy summer, this kid decided to spend it writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> he got he got sent to jail for his political opinions, and then he wrote them all in a book about his struggles. No, what? what? <laughs> and then a very popular rapper decided to really support him. <laughs> Gosh. Uh, the crazy part is is that it would be framed positively in, in the young <laughs> Hitler movie the, the crazy part is everyone's like oh that young go-getter that whippersnapper that harmless youth yeah hopefully they don't don't take the turn and being like did he have good ideas that's for you to decide audience like I did not want to sign I did not want to watch this movie I did not sign up for this well we are uh, kind of coming up on that time just a little bit so I'll go ahead and ask you if you have any like hyper specific things you're hoping to see hoping not to see you know we, we certainly don't want to see a scene where this character gets like you know cornered in a bunker by an, a like a standing army from a different country we don't want to see that because we all know how that ends for him i'm hoping to see this person be like really likable i know that's a very basic ask but um i'm hoping to see them like have a genuine friendship with their sidekick like i want that sidekick i want there to be a genuine friendship there i want them to be able to like spitball and feed off of each other what i don't want is a musical i know that's a really strange thing to throw in there but uh I, I feel like this title has thrown me for such a big loop i don't want to add musical on top of it god i really would love to just watch the producers instead of this movie right now <laughs> <laughs> like if i had the ability to hack into your tv and just put on the producers and you're no. like what, what what is this movie it doesn't even look like what he described i don't understand he keep it happy keep it snappy keep it gay <laughs> I, I don't think you're wrong with that. I think that's exactly what I basically asked for <laughs> with all of my whining and describing. Yeah. The producers does have Hitler in it. So... And it's a musical number. Checks all the boxes. Yeah, I think I think you literally just predicted that this movie would be the producers. But <laughs> without musical. Like but it. without musical. <laughs> you're like, please don't make it about Hitler. Please don't make it a musical. I'm like, you mean the producers. You're just talking about the producers now. <laughs> Don't make it the producers. I would really like a scene where uh, the two buddies get called into like a, uh, I don't know, like an office or something uh, for somebody who's like some kind of a, like an authority figure of some kind, maybe like a commander or a chief, uh, a chief of police, if you will. And he just yells at them for just going crazy out there and just having a crazy summer. And they need to tone down the craziness. And they, you know, he gets real mad at them and they're just like, come on, chief, leave us alone. And then he's like, all right, begrudgingly, I will now leave you alone and let you go back to doing crazy summer things. I want some semblance of that buddy cop scene that's in every buddy cop movie in this movie even if this movie's not a buddy cop movie i will accept that i think if the context is the main character the buddy cop character and like their neighbor friend or something like i would love that this setting to happen in that everybody knows this is a joke way where like the the desk that the the chief is slamming is just a really uh narrow box <laughs> And basically, I just want to hear their last name said with a lot of uh, disdain. Wentworth and Hannigan! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I was thinking, like, well, they could get called into, like, the principal's office, maybe for the college that they're, like, trying to attend. And maybe that's the crazy summer aspect. Like, he goes to the college and finds out that even though he's moved all of his stuff in, he didn't get accepted or whatever. And they're going to have to push him until next semester because, like, it's not that he missed the deadline. He totally got the deadline right. But they just had too many applicants this summer or whatever. So he spends the whole summer living out of his best friend's van that he's been, you know, oh, man, come and live in my van with me. And we'll go to all the cool, like, rock shows and stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. I've got a better idea for what I do want of this movie. I do want it to focus on male friendships. What I don't want to happen is just like leering at teenage girls in bikinis on the beach because it's summertime. And did you know that it's summertime and summertime involves the beach and girls? I'm okay with about one of those scenes, but if it's like a recurring thing or if the scene goes on for too long, it is genuinely like, okay, yeah, we get it. We know that young men are, they have an increased sense of libido and they're, you know, willing to look at girls because technically it's not illegal. And I love hey, that argument. Hey, turns out my, we're sorry, my wild and crazy job is a lifeguard and I'm just going to facepalm right then and there. <laughs> God damn it. I would love if it was like, because I know the Sandlot came out after this, but it would be great if they kind of did an inversion of the Sandlot scene where he's like, uh, he's doing his lifeguard job at the local pool or whatever. Some boy is like drowning and he's like, I don't know if I should save him. I'll have to kiss a young boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you something right now. Wendy Peppercorn would never. She went in to save a fucking life that day. God damn it. I, I believe you. I believe that's a lot of conviction. I believe that statement. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy Peppercorn, she she did her fucking duty, man. She didn't do nothing wrong. Yeah. So it's a good lifeguard. Great woman. Excellent lifeguard. That's what I hope. That I hope that this, our main character, if he does, sadly, become a lifeguard for his particular situation no shade on lifeguards as a profession i i hope that he does take his job seriously maybe his partner's doing it for like the wrong reasons like he's like yeah and we'll get to check out chicks and he's like no man come on uh, lifeguarding is a noble and serious profession hey what if i could summon jaws no you shouldn't because that's not what we do on the beach <laughs> i'm gonna go hit up the local library to see what attracts sharks to the area <laughs> no no <laughs> <laughs> oh, my childhood friend. <laughs> Doing jokes. <laughs> Surely jokes. Why would you do that? <laughs> Why are you like this? <laughs> yes. The questions that need to be answered, but won't be answered. All right. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and call it a day there and we'll get into this movie. And, you know, you'll have to hear us talking about it later. And that'll be, I'm, I'm sorry. You've already listened to so much See For Yourself. Now you're committed. You have to. You fucking have to. Don't you want to see what a summer looks like when it's crazy? You won't know unless you come back after the movie. And see for yourself. Chills. Bone, bone chilling chills. <laughs> you're looking for adventure and whatever comes your way then guess what it's see for yourself we're, well we're back and this was a pretty straightforward comedy i have i have a couple opinions about this and i don't want to i don't want to like slap you over the head with them so I'll, I'll i'll leave the floor open to you to go ahead and give me some of your first impressions hit, hit me with it i learned today that when somebody says i had a crazy summer they could potentially mean i was chased by people repeatedly and i should take that you know seriously because apparently chasing is a means of having a crazy time being chased by bikers or chased by a rich kid or chased by boats you could just be chased it could be a crazy time when you're chased i did not love how often the movie would introduce characters and then abandon them all together <laughs> Okay, I am not a camera handler, but like I said, you may hold me to this. On other podcast episodes, I care about what looks pretty. And there are plenty of times, I'd say towards the earlier part of the movie, where I'm like, have I seen an establishing shot? I just felt like I was thrown into a house. I was staring at a table and then we zoom out and there's a bad guy there. After that, I couldn't stop paying attention to how I'm introduced to somebody at like the bust or their hips. And I was like, where are we even? I just feel dragged. Yeah, the, the movie does jerk you around a lot in terms of uh, use of the camera. It doesn't do a very good job of uh, seamlessly transitioning between things or keeping both characters in a shot to like make it feel like things are really happening. It's very jumpy. And I can't tell if that's because like animation is such a big part of the story. That was one thing I really did like about, I guess, maybe the framing of this story. A lot of the bits of the story are sort of cut up with, I'm an animation major and I'm trying to do animation work and everything and here are a couple of my animations i don't know if that's maybe they're taking cues from popular animation or like amateur animation in the way that they're filming this 
this because animation can be kind of chaotic like that sometimes. I think they were trying to keep the pacing up because uh, if they weren't like showing a joke, they were trying to establish like uh, the trouble with Cookie or the budding romance with Cassandra. And if they weren't doing that, then I don't know, we're, we're at a new location preparing for the main struggle. I could tell that they wanted things to keep it snappy. So I'm just imagining what this movie would be like if they, they put in more time for scenery or any sort of like natural pauses because we were at, I think, an hour 30. God, the, the, the complete mishandling of some characters too. Really, they have like this awesome ensemble cast of honestly a lot of really great actors. And so many of them just get kind of like, yeah, so Cookie's going to like, you know, hit on him. And uh, oh, why is she hitting on him? Uh, I don't know. We need a reason for like the rich guy to like really hate him. And we can't come up with one at this point, I guess. So uh, Cookie's just trying to make out with the uh, uh, hoops. She wants to do that because of reasons. After that, she uh, won't be in the movie anymore uh, until the end, I guess. And then she'll just be there to make out with the other guy. Don't forget, like, these are your friends and they have your back, but they'll leave you buried up to your head in the beach for a lady. These are your friends and they have your back, but they won't listen to you when you say, hey, I'm a Cassandra kind of guy. But have you seen Cookie? You should go out with Cookie. We'll help you go out with Cookie. Yeah, I thought it was interesting also that like him and Cassandra's relationship is entirely based on mutual friendship, even from the very start. Hey, I'll help you out because I respect you as a human being. And then Hoops and Cookie's relationship is like, I don't know, she's pretty good looking, I guess. It's the sound of Auga. That's it. (laughs) Yeah. We nearly perfectly predicted this film. I was surprised every scene that came up. I was like, when I saw Rabies Dolphin, I was like, no, no, really? <laughs> we, there was a Godzilla scene. I predicted a Godzilla scene. <laughs> there was a ragtag group of people against a non ragtag group of people, and there was a CPR scene. <laughs> Where they refuse to perform CPR. Wendy Peppercorn would never. Yes. And I was like, I hope they're good at their jobs. These people were not good at their jobs. They were pulling ranks so that they didn't have to give CPR. Which is like, there's no way in hell. That is such a weird thing to like include in your 80s film. I get it. It's in the 80s and like gay panic is everywhere, you know? I thought it was because he was farted to death. It happens twice, remember? It does happen twice. But isn't the second time he's also sat on by the same big gentleman? Yeah, but the second time it's not implied that he ate chili and therefore farted him into unconscious consciousness but yes he does it's the same exact scenario two times which is kind of weird they probably could have found a different way to do it the second time and it's also weird that they didn't do it three times because normally comedy comes in threes so where's the third time that these guys show up and they're like ah this guy again come on it can't be a coincidence anymore they probably had an idea and they were just like this time instead of calling in the regular emts we'll call in the drag queen emts and they'll come out and they'll give them cpr happily or whatever Mm -hmm. i don't know whatever whatever would age like milk at this point point at least the fucking drag queen emts will do their fucking job (laughs) fuck's sake (laughs) also there was plenty of beach scenes there was um the first beach scene i saw i was like okay you got me i said please don't put any ladies with skippy bikinis so that we can leer over them and the first beach scene i got was a guy running for his life in a military simulator of the beach being blown up and i was like this is the most masculine beach I've seen in a comedy. <laughs> I did really love how he finds like the little beheaded doll on the beach. And he's just like, every time you find one of these, there's a girl somewhere crying over it, you know? And I'm like, yeah. Whoa, that's a <laughs> deep cut. My guy. <laughs> I was like, Mulan thought the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know I was about to cry in this movie. Lord. <laughs> Uh, and then we see a second one, and I remember thinking, okay, we're getting kind of close, but I don't remember the order. Um, by the time Cookie gets on the beach, I was like, oh, man, we have too much beach now. Oh, the second time we were on the beach, we have Cassandra. But she's, like, in her oversized sweater or something, so I was like, okay, it's a romantic beach, and she's not in a bikini, so this is different than what I expected. <laughs> There are some pretty good jokes, though. Like when they're all talking about how, like, you've graduated from high school, man. Your parents are going to buy you a car and that's going to set up, you know, success for the rest of your days. It's really your parents' way of saying that they want what's best for you. They want you to go out and get what's yours. And then it turns to his car that they got for him with, like, his name on it and everything. And it's just like a bulldozer. (laughs) 
actually missed all of the, well, not all. I missed the first two big hints that Hoops is not an appropriate name for this character because I saw paper all around when he's throwing out the animation idea and I was like, that's weird. Then his mom calls him Hoops and I was like, that's a weird name for your kid. And then he misses the shot at the gas station. I was like, why does he keep taking shots if he knows he's so bad? <laughs> yeah, I was trying to see more of like, because all of the characters kind of have, like Cassandra is the only normal name everybody else has like a silly name basically mm -hmm. and i was like where are the through lines for like like george calamari that's a weird fucking name or ak ak yeah teddy kind of has one but you only really hear it when his dad's mad yeah teddy or theodore and i don't know if that's like the president reference to the president i don't know you know john husak's the lead guy for this movie and, and demi moore's in it too and all all that's you know nice and wonderful but curtis armstrong plays ak ak and i love curtis armstrong congratulations on your find <laughs> I don't know this person. He's he's in a bunch of different stuff. I really love him in... He's in Animal House, and uh, I think he's in... Or maybe not Animal House, I'm sorry. I think it's Revenge of the Nerds that he's in. I think he's in Revenge of the Nerds, and he just plays this, like... He's at the same time a badass and kind of, like, a gross man's man. He's, he's like, an, a hard character to pin down exactly, but people don't really like him, basically, because he's kind of gross, and he thinks he's badass, but he's, like, a short, skinny dude. And he just gets a lot of cool moments in the movie, and he has a lot of cool lines, and I like him as this crazy over the top caricature of like masculinity and in this movie he's like kind of the opposite of that where he's a very normal guy and his dad is like this wacky caricature of masculinity and his dad's expecting him to be more of a wacky caricature of masculinity and he's just like no i want to kind of be my own man and, and do my own things and i'm like that's cool i hope he gets a moment where he gets to do something that's like traditionally seen as hyper masculine yeah and he and he does it and he does it. and it's great if i had to suggest something from curtis armstrong's like line of work though i would suggest uh dan versus it's his voice acting uh, in this particular show. He's such a good voice actor and he does he does do a lot of voice acting. And um, in this show, he plays a conspiracy theorist who like gets really sort of a overreacts to minor inconveniences and then attributes them to various conspiracies he has and tries to go out and topple that conspiracy. <laughs> Man's got a busy day. <laughs> Yeah, and it's it's just really funny and silly, and it's it's a good time. And it, it gets very over the top sometimes when he's like, the episode always starts with him doing something mundane, like, oh yeah, I gotta go and like cash this check at the bank, you know? And he goes there and the bank closes early and he's like, damn you, capitalism! <laughs> and and then he spends the rest of the episode trying to topple capitalism because it, it inconvenienced him slightly. Some people use spite in very productive ways. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, that's sort of Dan's character. In that. And, it's, and it's played by Curtis Armstrong. We love Curtis Armstrong. That's our boy. Yes. I recognize the voice from Egg instantly, but I didn't know why. So I was like, what is going on here? Did it start with this? Is this the movie where we found this voice? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Shark with Necklace. No. <laughs> But it's it's close. It's very close. This would have been one of his earlier films for sure. Uh, same with John Husak. In, in fact, uh, there's another movie John Husak does called uh, Better Off Dead. And we almost covered Better Off Dead. I saw that movie for the first time in my life with a very good friend of mine in one of the worst nights of both of our lives. Excluding, oh, no. excluding the part where we watched the movie. That oh. part was fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was like, no, in this memory, they had a bad day and then it went worse, but good. <laughs> no, Better Off Dead was great. And uh, we almost, this almost was like one of the first movies we covered for the podcast, but it like just barely missed the window. We came up with the idea for the podcast, maybe like a week or two later or some shit like that. Or we started recording episodes for the podcast, maybe a week or two later. We already had the idea, but we hadn't started recording yet. So we missed out on this opportunity and I haven't found somebody else to watch it with yet. John Husak almost plays the exact same character in both movies except in better off dead he's vaguely thinking about killing himself but he has like the same character arc where he's like oh man things are hard for me because i have all these things i want to do but i can't do them for whatever reason and it's frustrating me and so now i will go on this like life affirming journey where i will meet a woman whom i'm attracted to and then i will i don't know get involved in a race somehow to win her favor 
it repeats even the race part. Yeah, except in this one, it's a ski race. <laughs> Just get that man in some some race somehow, some kind of way. Yeah, so that's frustrating. It's uh, You can't say the same thing for him that you can for Curtis Armstrong. At least Curtis Armstrong is willing to play a different character sometimes. John Husack is like, woe is me. I'm an artist of some kind who's not, you know, enjoying life as well as he could be enjoying it. Oh, but the love of a good woman come long and done save me from my woes. Sometimes it's not the fault of the actor that they get typecast. Some movie does really well and they're like, the audience, the public demands that you play that one character really well. And we're all inspired to write more pieces just like that last movie you did. Yeah, it's just, it's frustrating for me because he, he clearly has some degree of like uh, comedic timing and an ability to do this. I would just like to see him play a character that's a little more over the top, a little more wacky. The wackiest character in this movie is Egg, right? Yes. I like Egg uh, generally. I think he's a fun character. He clearly cares a lot about his friends. He has some trauma about being a fat kid when he was growing up and getting picked on a lot slash and or how he picked on a fat kid. It's it's kind of hard to say exactly. That that scene was weirdly touching for me and Ak looks at him and he's like, Egg, were you the fat kid that got picked on? And he's like, uh, no, I loved picking on the fat kid. I, mean, I kept yelling at him and calling him fat and it was great. That's what the story is about. And there's a part of me that's like, they didn't play it this way. They, they played that part of it straight. But what if that was like the intended joke? Like the joke <laughs> is meant to be a little bit deeper here in that he's like, no, shut up. I, of course it's not me. It's somebody else. And I I was picking on him. I'm the guy picking on him. Leave me alone. That's how I read it too. I read it like Clay, his twin brother, was going to be like, did it really hurt you, bro? And he's like, no, no, it would never really. It wasn't even about me. No. I also liked how they, they reused the chainsaw from earlier where Cookie is like, oh, yeah, we can go and watch the moon rise up. And he's like, oh, I don't know. And then he sees the scene. He's like, oh, on second thought. Yeah, let's go. And then uh, they bring back the chainsaw later when Clay comes up and he's like, he dropped off his car and he hit me. And <laughs> they chainsaw up the, the, the car. That's yes. a nice reusing of that chainsaw. I like leave, leave nothing left behind, you know? Yeah. If it's good for the story, you can use it twice. Um, I was surprised when we meet Cassandra. She's stashing the cash in the paper towel thing. Then Hoops comes in, finds money, and then gets really loud about having money. <laughs> I know that's for the plot. I know that's to help her out. But then afterwards, she comes to him and she's like, hey, thanks for helping me out back there. And by helping me out, I mean throwing my money that I worked really hard for and stashed away from those guys. So now I also don't have that money. But thanks. This story feels like they fucked that up somehow because the biker with the pink hair and the Liberty Spikes is such a like iconic looking character. You don't forget that guy. The whole movie, you're waiting for him to just show up and start doing something something but he never does and it feels like such a waste to have such an interesting character that you'll never fucking forget just wasted in the first like 10 minutes he's gone now he's never coming back and the easiest way to fix this problem is if maybe hoops grabs the money and quietly leaves and then turns around and goes oh my god there's a bunch of hundred dollar bills in this trash can yeah it was that it, yes yes that's what i mean it, it, why did he have to yeah you're preserving exactly what i mean to preserve you did a better job at it i knew the character was written off as soon as his underlings were laughing at him because fish were impaled on his pink spikes. So that was my one saving grace for the character. They did at least pay off the haircut in a funny and cool way. I appreciate that at least. You know, they didn't just put the hair in to make him look silly. It's actually for a pretty funny gag. But I did fully expect for him to come back later and be like, hey, I'm gonna rough you up, you know? Yeah. I thought for sure they'd get into like a tight spot. Maybe uh, they made all the money back and they were about to go and like pay it off and then the the rich kid comes and beats him up for the money or something and then then the bikers beat the rich kid up yeah 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 <laughs> something you know and, and what i would have done honestly is have you know hoops like oh hey there's a bunch of hundred dollar bills in this trash can they come out running like oh you stowed it in the trash can you stupid lady uh and they run out to grab their money out of the trash can and sure enough hoops comes back into the bathroom he's like come on and he like gets her out of there and starts running with her and then they're like oh dang and they start chasing them and they escape them the same exact way 
but then they return and they're the antagonists for the rest of the movie instead of having to introduce this like rich kid for whatever reason now we can have these like fun bikers who look kind of silly and also i would like for all the bikers to have like a silly wig on like they could be the wig bikers it's a lot of fun to be had here yeah i like your rewrite because um as far as nemesis go teddy whispers teddy yells but it's teddy's dad that's unhinged if we could just play teddy's dad as main antagonist instead of putting teddy as this degree of separation between <laughs> dangerous i mean i i guess i'm what i'm saying is teddy's dad has the same biker vibes so it just amps up the stakes that our heroes are going against people that literally want something like what does teddy want more houses not work what does he want yeah i also think that there could be a cool thing where like teddy is the antagonist for hoops but the bikers are the antagonist for cassandra so each of them has like something coming after them Ooh, i like this keep talking keep talking and this way like and and it, and it could be cool because then maybe when once maybe they both like before the climax they both defeat their respective villains but then they accidentally bring them together and now teddy's dad and teddy are teaming up with the wig biker gang and maybe even teddy's dad who has the wacky your haircut is like, oh, I respect your uh, do there, sir. And the bikers are like, ah, oh, yeah, old man, you, you ain't so bad yourself. And he's got these, you know, because the number of mullets in this movie are fucking insane, by the way. Like, there's so many mullets. <laughs> this is the ultimate showdown. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking as I'm hearing like the bad guys know that they're bad guys and they're high-fiving each other for punching the good guys. It's community building. I, I like it. I really do. And then and then the movie climaxes in a big like, aha, I've teamed up with the bikers and the bikers have teamed up with me and now we're going to get you instead of like, yeah, and then we had a, a, a race in our yachts, our little mini regatta boats or whatever. I could not suspend my Dis. belief and be like, wow, you know, those kids, they just found some spare parts and made her ship worthy or water were they at? I don't know nautical terms that well. Instead, I'm like, where'd you get the money to? Where'd you get the money? Isn't that a lawsuit? Aren't you stealing from the rich guy? I'm pretty sure he can sue you because, you know, he's rich. <laughs> How are you building this boat? With what money? I don't see you guys having summer jobs, except for the store twins. That was another thing I thought would have been a funny gag instead of like, oh no, Uncle What's-His-Name is like, he finally got the money, but oh, the phone got cut off. That's not a fun payout for that. What would have been a fun payout is we need to borrow the million dollars to help us with this boat race and then he's like no no i'm not gonna give it to her but auntie makes him and it's like no <laughs> so wait another yes. summer to get his million dollars <laughs> i like that so much yes i didn't yes you're on a roll i love this rewrite i do it fits it well for me because we we emphasize that grandma is not really in the making friends business of family members <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she cares about the money, and she's like, I don't have enough money to buy them a boat, but my husband does. <laughs> I think they did pretty good with the one kid that they kept, Squid. She says just Bosco, I think. So, I mean, I think they were scared to use her, but they did give her rewarding parts. She's cute. Yeah, insult her dog. You get a comeuppance. And how she steered a <laughs> dolphin is questions that we don't need to answer. Yeah, the, the use of a submarine dolphin movie prop uh, is a little confusing there, but I don't need to know. It's, it's absurdist comedy. It, it doesn't need to be explained. Did Bosco have puppies? That's what it looked like. And those puppies were born with collars. They were pretty old for puppies, too, because that's not how puppies look when they come out. They were like walking and like barking and stuff like those were at least a couple weeks old. You know, like they're almost dogs. At fuck's sake. <laughs> I don't know if I'm any more qualified than a regular viewer to make guesses about somebody's age. But I could have sworn that Teddy was up there. So when he had like a dad figure <laughs> and he was acting like a teenager, I was like, uh. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> But Teddy, mm, you're I think like, you're old. Yeah, you're, you're like uh, like thirty, right? Like, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some actors that can pull off like a fifteen-year-old well into their forties, <laughs> and then there are some actors who absolutely cannot. <laughs> I see you're clean-shaven, but is that enough for me? I, d I don't know. I don't know. I do not know why this movie hates lobsters as much as it does. <laughs> I agree. When they got revenge and they put the lobsters in the pool, I was like, lobsters don't do well in chlorine. But I had to remember that this is not a, a safety video. This is a comedy. So I just had to like, let it happen. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I also think they could have attached more lobsters to them as they're getting out of the pool because having like one lobster nipping at you or two lobsters nipping at you, not as funny to me as like, oh my God, that woman is wearing an entire skirt made out of lobsters <laughs> they're just all over her. I wasn't sure that they were going to do it for Cookie. I knew they were going to do it for Teddy, but I wasn't sure. I thought Cookie was going to just like be like, oh, bye. You know, this is this is a show of me not being loyal to you. But no, they, they give her lobsters too. Which is weird because of the two, of them it seems like cookie is the more villain again we get like she's not full-blown teresa levels of like impish hellion we miss that we miss that now <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. i want you to go full tilt with it you know like i'd rather have a girl just being like <laughs> than have a girl who's like oh i guess i'll kiss this other guy because my boyfriend's not immediately right in front of me tonight <laughs> Hey, that was really mean of you to like not pick up my hitchhiking friend. I don't pick up hitchhikers. Can you get me popcorn? I'll eat a ginormous bag of popcorn if it means sitting just three more inches closer to you. I mean, the, the hitchhiker bit was pretty fucking hilarious, to be honest with you. They put water on her too. Like mud all in the mouth. Of the two of their of their grievances, two 18-year-old guys having a like a schoolyard altercation, you know, even if it does get physical and they rough each other up a bit. I don't really see that as being as heinous as like going out of your way to emotionally manipulate people and like lying and fooling around and telling your boyfriend like, oh, him and all of his friends jumped me. Like that's, that's, that's harder to forgive to me than like, I got upset. So I tried to start a fight with another guy that I was upset with. And you know, I don't know, those things kind of happen. You know, you get upset and you try to rough somebody up a little, whatever. Speaking of roughing people up, the other children that are present in this movie are nameless and represent mob violence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know why he showed up with like two or three other cars worth of people because like he's stronger than all of uh Hoops' friends put together. Oh, oh well well hold on. Except for uh Egg's brother. Egg's brother, like we see him without a shirt on at one point, and he's actually pretty fit. <laughs> Well, I mean that there were like maybe 20 kids getting a survival lesson at what, 10 p.m. on the beach? Enough to terrorize like Cookie and, and Hoops, but it's a weird choice. It's a weird choice for me. Well, I thought he was like a, I thought Akak's dad was like a scout master. Like he's supposed to be like an Eagle Scout or something. Or he's like the head of the JROTC program at the element or at the middle school or whatever. And I thought that it was like some sort of ceremony they just happened to be holding at night. Like some kid was getting Eagle Scout or he was getting some 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 badge of honor or something or other and that's what they were showing up for okay because to me it just seemed like hey it's nighttime let's have everybody get together and simulate rescuing from a plane crash <laughs> Shit, I can't, I can't remember exactly. I was just lost. So I was like, okay, this is happening, I guess. I did like <laughs> that the kids are like so violently ready to help people that they don't care that the person's like, no, please, get off of me. Yes, I, I like that Hoops is like, save me. And then he's like mummified, basically. <laughs> and she looks at him in horror. And then the kids say, save her. <laughs> and then they like attack. Yeah. <laughs> save her. Save her now! <laughs> also, Hoops falls down. He falls downstairs. He falls down hills. He tumbles over himself. Yeah. More jokes? I, I get that it's like, that's the slapstick type of humor, but it just seems so, like, there are some jokes that are well written, and almost every time the Hoops falls down is just not well written or polished in any way. It's just slapped in there. Yeah, it doesn't feel like we're built building up to anything. It just happens. And so, like, yeah, there's no tension to release. It's just being let go. Like, like a really loose guitar string. I think the idea is that he's supposed to be falling down anytime he's like close to having a romantic moment with a woman, but it just, they don't really do a good job of building that tension and then getting close to the like, you know, Hoop, I was just thinking, and then their faces are getting closer and closer to each other and she drops her vase that she's been holding and it lands on his foot and he falls over. Yeah, I can get behind that. Or we could have more hints in the animation where he's a hippopotamus, that the hippopotamus trips over himself so we can be like, like, oh, they're calling back to the he's hopeless kind of bit. I thought it was a rhinoceros in the uh, animation. You, you are absolutely right. I, I said the wrong word. I was picturing the rhinoceros instead of hippopotamus. Oh, they look really close. It doesn't, you know. It's no, funny. it's the words. It's the words. It's just the words. I think it's interesting that he makes himself a rhinoceros and he makes like the, I don't know, I guess the, the rabbits are supposed to represent like posh people or like, you know, popular people or or, or fancy people. I don't know. Not, not atypical people when he draws 
because uh, Cassandra, she's just like a regular lady. Because how would he, how would he find love at the end of the story as a rhinoceros with a bunny? He doesn't like those people, but that's a whole group he's written off forever. Why not draw her as a rhinoceros? He drew Cookie as a cat. Because rhinoceroses are not skinny and feminine. That is very true. He drew Cookie as a skinny feminine cat, so I'm sure he could have drawn Cassandra as a... No, no. Cassandra was hypersexualized. You even have her nipples in the animation. Cookie also got nipples. No, no, no. Yet, I'm... Cookie is the one with the nipples I'm talking about. <laughs> It's late. It is late. I'm so sorry. Oh, no. I am so sorry. Yes, I noticed Cookie's character had nipples. Yeah, that seemed a little little weird. That's her whole character, kind of, unfortunately. You know, did you know that she's good to look at? I wish that we got more of the animation stuff and more of it to sort of, like, punctuate some of the interesting parts of the story. Because it sort of comes up immediately to indicate the, like, struggle he's going through with getting into art school. And then it comes up again once they get onto the boat and we get to the next part of the story when they're going to Nantucket. And then it seems like almost forever before we get another one. And I was just kind of really hoping to see it come up a lot more often. I think the next time we get it is when he finally gets the date with Cookie. I don't know. I I just don't see like the date with Cookie as being anything other than like, we're just kind of moving the plot along so that uh, Teddy can be mad at you instead of like something that's significant in any way. Yeah, like when they had Teddy represented by Godzilla, I was like, this means Hoops has come to his senses and he's not going to go on the date with Cookie. And then you open the door and she's there and instead of saying, nope, and walking right past her, the date's on. And this is part of the joke, but in the car, he has a big bush with a safari hat and glasses to try and keep any anonymity in case Teddy does find them. But then those come off and they stay off when he comes back to the car. Because I thought when she's like, get me popcorn, he's like, yeah, will do. And like would not come back, but he does. I thought for sure he was going to leave and go see Cassandra. Um, Yeah. You mentioned that you thought this might be a musical. There's two different songs. But they're not sung by the characters, though, right? No, no, Cassandra. But she's a singer. And it's not about her feelings. It's about... Whoa! 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 (laughs) You got some real specific fucking rules for what makes a musical. (laughs) Okay. okay, musicals need an I want song. She's just singing because that's her profession. That's not a musical. I don't know. Maybe the thing she wants is not to look back. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, while we're talking about Don't Look Back, I could not get over that the background singers, are the backup singers, are not singing Don't Look Back at the same rate that I'm hearing Don't Look Back. Well, when we think about like recording audio, and this is something we don't really talk about a whole lot on uh, the podcast, but it is difficult to record audio in the room that it's happening in, especially like it's a crowded bar, there's people moving around, and there's some lady who's trying to sing a song at the center of it. It can be kind of difficult to have like and then John Husek's in the corner here talking and he's saying oh thanks for coming by and then there's all the bits with the you know and and we can do some movie fuckery here but it might be just easier to silence everything and then put in each audio track one by one and sort of stagger them on top of each other over the visuals you know what I mean I do but what I thought would happen is that they would give the backup singer extras a track so that they know oh this is the rate at which I should say don't look back and I don't think that happened. Yeah, I mean, it could have been uh, recorded separately. There are a couple of bits like that. Like, um, what is it? Cookie asks, did you uh, get my popcorn? And instead of keeping the same shot or like moving the camera slightly to the left to show John Husack's character, they cut, put the camera in Cookie's perspective and then show John Husack throwing a big bag of popcorn at her. And I'm sitting here like, why did they do that? And the answer is probably tried it a couple of different ways and the best version of it was this one. Even if... As an audience member, I'm kind of jarred by the choice to like split this up into two different portions instead of just having it one contiguous shot. Mm -hmm. So they might have tried it a couple different ways and this was just the best sounding one and that's what they had and deal with it, question mark. (laughs) 
Yeah, choices have been made already. This is the best version of it. Like, there's a couple of things like that, too. Cassandra smacks a hole in the boat with the little tiny shot glass thing. Mm -hmm. Later, they're like, oh, come on, guys, let's go work on the engine. It cut to, all right, guys, let's go work on the engine. Separate shot. And now the place where she punctured the hole in, in the thing is at a different spot. I wasn't paying that close attention. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, there's there's little things we can poke holes in here all, all day. Sure. Yeah, the, the, the audio for the singing thing is going to be just a difficult thing a lot of the time. I have a question. I don't know if I, I'm asking on behalf of you, audience, that also has this question, or it's just me being tired. But when Cassandra is talking about saving the house and saving the people, who is she talking about? Yeah, so this might be one of those things where, and this happens in movies a lot, actually, where they film the scene where we meet Cassandra's family and we walk through the house and there's some wacky stuff that happens there, probably. But when they were finally getting the movie out, they were like, hey, the movie's two hours long and the exact executives are saying they're not going to put it out unless we get it down to closer to like 90 minutes. And they're like, no, I thought we, I thought we said we were going to get to do two hours. Like, yeah, well, uh, so they re-edit it down and the parts that they're able to cut are, you know, it's a house, it's a big house. People are definitely living in the house. We don't need to have a scene where we go in and show it. And let's cut a bunch of the establishing shots too, because they take up five or six seconds each and cut all those. And I, I don't know. And they're just like cutting stuff left and right. And that's why it's so cutty, so jumpy. So, you know. Yes, I do think that's what happened. But she made it sound like the estates were a refuge for low income families. So I was like, can we get a bit more specific about who the people are? Or are maybe they're just people that have had this house forever and don't want it turned into a restaurant. I just, I want to know their stories so that I can... That could have been a really cool, funny scene where it's like, all right, I'll show you my house if you want to, Hoops. And he's like, of course, I want to meet your mom and dad. That's going to be cool. They go in and it's just like 90 people living in the South <laughs> Saints for a commune. <laughs> And then she gets her hair done by one of them as she's talking about how it came to be. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. God, he, he that, there could be a totally cool line there where, she, where he's like, oh, yeah, I, I love your haircut. And she's like, oh, yeah, a uh, goober over here does it for me for free. It's one of the perks of living in the in the big house. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then a guy comes up and he's like, ah, I'll do your hair, darling. <laughs> <laughs> good old goober huh? and your and your uh your cohort dr blurgen blind and he's like oh yes darling i am working later tonight on my creation uh, my creature i mean creation i said creation <laughs> <laughs> it's just budget frankenstein <laughs> When I saw the whole miniature city, I was like, are you the real estate guy that I predicted in cul-de-sac? <laughs> are you into shady real estate deals? <laughs> you, I know exactly what I could cast you in, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I love how Mr. Uh, I think his name is Mr. F Mr. Fang or Mr. F Mr. I can't, I can't. Chong Freen. That's right. I was mixing his first and last name together. Mr. Freen sees this like Godzilla parody thing happening. Like he, he thinks it's all planned and he's just laughing and smiling like, oh, this is great. What a fun party. And I'm like, what an accurate representation of how like a normal person would think, oh, what a funny little skit you put on for me. This is totally normal and cool and funny. And like everybody else is running and screaming. And I'm like, why are they running and screaming? Like they're at a rich party. They should think that some wacky stuff is going to happen, right? Yeah. Yep. Have you guys never even been rich before? <laughs> I think you're fake rich. I think you're new rich. <laughs> we're old money. We, you know, we're, we're classy about it. These people, new money, trash. <laughs> yes. So what do you think about raising the exact amount of money you need in a night and the plot still saying, nah, you can't get your house back. You got to do that boat race. Jesus Christ. And, and I, I the, the worst part about this is it happens again. Like at the end, he's like, you need the boat race. We need the house. Let's swap skis. And Teddy's like, eh, nah, fuck you. I'm going to take the trophy and you can fuck off. I hate you. I'm You're only half right. Wink, wink. And then his grandfather shows up and is like, no, fuck you. What I enjoy about this grandfather is he puffs on cigars at every hour of the day and nobody is afraid for being in the will or not being in the will. Like they still talk about what he approves of. Yeah, nobody's like, okay, look, this guy's dying any second now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I just feel like he takes away a lot of the agency of the characters. And so does like the the, the, the Mr. Freen situation where he's like, yeah, I'm just not going to give it to you because uh, uh, I did my due diligence. Fuck off, kids. And then Teddy's like, no, nah, fuck you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take what I want. And it's only by the grace of this old man who's giving his first line in the entire movie that we actually get to have a victory. Accurate. It's like, well, it's a good thing there are good people in the world. Otherwise, you know, this movie would have been a bummer. This movie becomes infinitely sadder if we're just like <laughs> it's too real <laughs> it's a little little too close to the, the fact I, honestly it, this could have been a really fun like uh bummer ending to have the rich man come up and be like yeah, no teddy not only are we gonna take their their trophy and their house but i'm also gonna spit on them <laughs> <laughs> they spit on them so much in this movie <laughs> Like, as they're passing the boat by, a whole crew of shipmates raises the bird and spits. And you know, the wind carries it because they all like, they wince, like they, and they wipe their face like they received it. Yeah. I also, God, man, that ending was so fucked. Calamari shows up and he's like, ah, come on, Cookie, when are we going to stop playing these games? And she's just like, yeah, all right, I can make out with this guy. <laughs> Teddy just wouldn't satisfy me. I'm, I'm looking for anybody that can get the job done. <laughs> When are we going to call people cheaters in this race? Because when Teddy's dad starts harpooning the sail, I was like, oh, cool. So they won't be able to win even if they win because they sabotaged. But then the group of people we're rooting for are not using marine approved engines. So they would be disqualified too. And I was like, okay, so nobody has any rules in this race. That's nice to know. Uh... I mean, that's kind of one of those things with these types of plot points. There's always like an understood amount of like, yeah, well, if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I was used to it being like at least somebody calling it out. Well, you show me in the rule book where it says you can't have a car engine for a ship engine. If I were to do this plot point, like if somebody was twisting my arm and said, no, 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 the movie has to end with a cool boat race. And I'm like, okay. And there's got to be a lot of cheating in it. They got to cheat a lot. Okay, okay. I would just go to infinity with it where like they have like full on artillery weapons and they blow the ever loving hell out of the other person's boat. And they're blowing up this person's boat. Nah, da, 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 da. And then they're like, well, everybody's boat got blown to smithereens, and uh, so I guess nobody wins. And then the fucking, the good guy's boat, just the part that says, like, SS barely made it. The, the SS barely made it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll just, the, just barely cross the finish line with the main character, like, holding on to that piece of wood. And they'll be like, no, wait, they made it! <laughs> 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 and the thing is, like, what's it, the tradition holding referees, the, the people that start off the race, they are in no way worried about the spirit of the regatta being abused. They're like, yeah, I mean, rich kids about to win. Oh, I guess not this year. Okay, cool. <laughs> like, they did not pay attention to any of the man overboard that happened in the second leg of the race. I did like that they actually showed, like, pretty much the full, because, like, rescuing someone who's, you know, man overboard is a clumsy person process it's not elegant at all mm -hmm. showing the whole process of it or at least a lot of the process of, of rescuing a man from a man overboard was kind of nice for me because uh a lot of movies would like skip over that because it's so clumsy and it doesn't look very good and you know let's just let's keep them fun and sexy and skip that part i, I see that a lot in movies and i'd, I'd rather not like let, no fucking show it show the show the shitty like oh god i gotta fucking keep this guy's head above <laughs> water and i gotta <laughs> Do like a fucking the side stroke. hug dog paddle <laughs> it is not fun and like when you're training for these things too they're like you think this sucks now imagine the guy weighs another hundred fucking pounds because the, <laughs> the, the dummy you have is heavy but it's not as heavy as a real guy <laughs> Just appreciating the work that people do to save lives and for more accurate depictions of that. You're never going to be saving someone drowning when he weighs like 110 pounds. He's he's going to be like a 400 pound dude who never knew how to swim in the first place. And he's thrashing around like a fucking lunatic. He's going to be an Arnold Schwarzenegger bodybuilder who's just dead waiting on you. And you're like, oh, come on, man, fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> you see people go out into the beach and you're like, I could handle that. I could handle that. And you're like, sir, no, you, sir, no. The ocean is not for you today. Not on my shift. It's not. I'm sorry. You can't have fucking quads that big and get in the water. You're going to sink like a lead weight. <laughs> Don't talk to me about my lats. <laughs> you have lifted so many weights, you've become one. <laughs> I did think that it was um, the, the Stork Brothers. I liked them so much, but I also felt like the, the voice that Egg does, because it's clearly like a wacky voice he's doing. <sighs> 
I don't know. It's like vaguely overpowering. Yeah, overpowering to the point of being like, oh, I don't understand. Is he like making a caricature of somebody? I, I, I want to be optimistic and just say he's an eccentric individual with a with a silly stutter. But I also am kind of like, is he just making fun of people with a stutter? I don't know. I can't tell exactly. I um I was able to get through the movie under the belief that Egg talks weird. That's Egg as a character. But as for the choice to talk weird, I don't get paid to do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I think for a lot of it, it is like just meant to be like, I'm just doing this for emphasis and eccentricity. But uh, I think there's a way of doing this where it is, I'm making fun of people that have stutters. I, I think the, the reason that it's not making fun of people that have stutters is that every character treats him like a normal dude, basically. That's true. Nobody says like, I ah, get this freak who can't even talk right out of my face. Uh, it does kind of seem like they're saying people with a stutter are weird. But because everyone just treats him like a normal guy, now it just seems like he just talks kind of funny. And that's yeah. okay. You're allowed to do that. I think that explains it because it was distracting at first because I was like, is he is he slower than the rest of us? And I was like, no, no, he's not. To me, that scene was confirmed when uh, Cookie was like, can you help us push our boat in the water? And he's like, no, we work for you. No, I'm off the clock. <laughs> Why would I do more work? Then he's pushed into doing the work. But the whole time he's doing the work, he's like, yeah, do you have anything heavier for me to do? I, I think I could shovel your driveway while we're here. <laughs> You want me to lift your car, maybe? Something, <laughs> something yeah. like that? Yeah. Um, those jokes landed with me. I was like, wow, that guy is pretty upset. But what can you do when you're an underling, right? <laughs> That, that pissed me off because, like, so they said there were eight girls there. So eight girls, three guys. Okay, I get it. Egg is kind of a, not only does he sound kind of goofy and talks kind of, you know, weird by most people's standards, he's also not, you know, very contemporarily attractive. But his brother definitely is, even though the movie's kind of trying to play it like he's... Not? Yeah, like, for whatever reason, the movie is not pointing out, like, this is a very handsome and, and very fit young individual. We already got a main character. All right, you need to tone it down. You need to wear a shirt, okay? Do not make eyes at the camera. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. they're going to see what they're going to see. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know. I, you told me to put on shorts for this and we're on a beach, so I don't have a shirt on because that's how it works. And like, yeah, we don't have enough money to buy you a shirt for this scene. Just, I don't know, try to not look so hot. Don't be flexing or nothing. You ruined this scene by flexing. And he's like, I didn't mean to. I'm sorry. My muscles are just so big. <laughs> yes. Oh, my, my bad, uh, Mr. Savage, the director <laughs> whose first name is Savage for some reason. I apologize. I apologize, sir. Uh, the casting director really let me down this time. <laughs> You, you said you had two comedic golden actors and this guy's got two ta two people's talents worth in just that voice he does and this other guy's got nothing. <laughs> I don't want women to be distracted about who to root for in this movie. You sent me a golden goose attached to a, a sex pot and I, I hate it. <laughs> 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 just just put him like three feet back from everybody else and hope nobody's paying attention, I guess. But, ah, fucking hell. Go okay. <laughs> Can we just have Egg speak louder? Your your handsomeness is getting in the shot. Just have Egg shout, ah! That'll get everybody's attention back where it needs to go. That has got to be it. The, the whole movie, Egg is just played straight. He's basically like ak character, but on Egg's like lines. And they're like, yeah, this is working out great. And then they get to the scene where his brother has no shirt on and they're like, he's just so distracting. Can you do like a crazier like character to kind of, and he's like, uh, yeah, like, uh, what do you expect? Don't change the lines any, just, uh, get, uh, just make your voice a lot crazier. Just like, more over the top, more eccentric. And he's like, yeah, oh, uh, sure. Uh, 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 and he's like, yeah, no, perfect, perfect. Yes, just like that. Just like that. That's perfectly distracting. And then he's like, well, I guess, do you just want me to do it in this one, sir? And he's like, no, I guess it wouldn't make a lot of sense if you got it just in this one scene. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll reshoot all the other scenes and you'll, you'll just be going at it just the exact same way. And he's like, oh, God. Not on my watch will anyone feel any kind of way about Clay. Not on my watch. <laughs> Okay, okay. What if it wasn't the director? Like, the director's fine with it, but John Husack is like, No! No! <laughs> he hulks out and his shirt just rips a little bit. <laughs> He's like, No! <laughs> Meanwhile, they're like, they try to put a shirt on Clay, and the moment they do it, just he takes one step and the sh shirt just rips into a million tiny pieces <laughs> just under the weight of his huge muscles. <laughs> <laughs> explodes off of him. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Husak. I, uh, 
I didn't mean to. Teddy's all upset because he has to swim six more laps before he even gets close to that kind of physique. God, I had to airbrush on a lot of Teddy's muscles. <laughs> and then I airbrushed down a lot of Clay's muscles. <laughs> Clay, can you can we reshoot the scenes in like three months once you've grown like a full pelt of hair over all these muscles of yours? Oh uh, yeah, of course, sir. I'll, uh, we don't even have to wait three months. I'll just flex my muscles and hairs will grow. <laughs> so, so, somebody get Clay a sandwich. He needs to get on those cars. Get somebody him a buy- Burger. Somebody buy this man 14 pizzas and he, you have to eat each and every one of them before each and every scene. <laughs> uh, of course, sir, but uh, I don't know if you know this. I don't actually have a stomach. I just have a combustion engine. Where a stomach would go. <laughs> uh, this does help me with my uh, caloric intake needs for the day. No, no, no more pizzas. No, no more pizzas. <laughs> that actually wasn't uh, like, a, like a car engine at the back of the boat. It was just Clay's like abs. <laughs> That's the movie we need to see. <laughs> Clay the Reckoning. Oh no! <laughs> so I was wondering why everybody was paddling out of sync. And like that would have been a nice quick win for our ragtag team. You know, the power of friendship makes us in sync. And so when I say row, everybody rose. Nah, <laughs> we're just going to rely on Egg and his uh, fandom fanship and his feelings for mr congeniality being disrespected that's what's gonna help us get the leg up on this race yeah i didn't i didn't love that bit either but it didn't i mean it's about as good as any other option you know you could come up with something else but you're basically just putting the same the same concept on a different horse you know yeah still effectively does the same thing and at the end of the day like uh, this is all the writers could come up with okay just throw it in whatever for that bit at least like if it seems like one of the like low impact like and then i say something to get egg to row faster and like writers what do we say uh, i don't know he likes mr congeniality a lot something like that i guess can we come up with something better i can make it work don't worry about it we, we got other things we need to do yeah we gotta we gotta focus on toning down clay's fucking <laughs> insane physique how about we just spend this whole scene focused on what's happening in the rich kid's boat until clay finds another shirt he can put on <laughs> <laughs> Clay doesn't even wear shirts. He wears an entire parachute that they just tailored to look like a shirt. <laughs> it's like the only thing that can contain his huge muscles. I uh, we are we are kind of coming up on that time, and I guess I uh, I do wonder: are there any uh, last minute little things you'd like to point out? I'll go ahead and hit you with one. One of the predictions you made is that this uh, this movie would be about young Adolf Hitler, you know, not getting accepted into art school. And while there wasn't a whole lot of young Adolf Hitler references, there was one when they're building the boat they do a salute upwards to a big flag that they're cutting down and they don't do like a normal salute where you take your hand up to about your eyebrow and then go straight they salute upwards at it with their whole hand and their whole arm in much you know like the nazis would do a salute and so when that scene came up i was like we did it we perfectly predicted a movie (laughs) we got everything in here (laughs) I I did see that and think that's weird, but I also thought maybe they're doing this strange way of pointing out the one and only flag they want sawed down. It's that one, the one directly above us, that one. They didn't marinate on it, but I'm happy to have one point. Yes! (laughs) Another one under the belt. I am very thankful that this movie did not take itself too seriously. And I think that's what I need to just start catering my predictions towards. That this movie can be fun, can take itself in a funny way. And uh, instead of being like, oh gosh, they're going to make a statement. They're going to make a statement. So I'm going to work on that. I did wish there was more chemistry between uh, John Husak's character and uh, Demi Moore's character. Because to be honest with you, Cookie had like more electricity with literally every character she's interacting with, basically. Even the scenes with her and Teddy, I like, I bought it. Like, I was like, I think Cookie's into Teddy. And then her scenes with John Husack, I'm like, I guess she's into hoops, I guess. And then she has her scene with uh, George. Yeah, with Calamari. And I believed it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Every time Demi Moore and John Husak kiss, I'm like, I guess those two actors had to kiss each other, right? <laughs> that is one way of, yeah. I didn't pay attention before this movie, but I really like the way Demi Moore speaks. I think it's very soothing. And I was like, wow, hooray. I found a, a woman whose voice was like, that is a kind of girlfriend, I guess, isn't it? That, that's a kind of, you can just want a nice, soothing, aged <laughs> voice. 
uh, kind of well, what's not aged weathered i should say it's kind of weathered things haven't been all so so nice for cassandra but she's making it work and it like it, it's in her voice it's non-aggressive i would say that both you and i have aggressive voices <laughs> way of describing both of us yeah so unfortunately we need partners who are like i'm okay with listening to someone talk and it basically being a saber-toothed tiger screeching into my ear every time they open their mouth i'm okay with that in, in fact i'm on board and i i actually thought that there was a scene where ted is trying to get into the pool with uh with cookie and it's a scene with the lobsters and everything but leading up to that you know he's like kind of holding her and then he's walking over there and she didn't quite follow because she's upset for some reason there's no audio here and he just like snaps his fingers for her to come over and immediately i'm kind of like oh that's you know that's misogynistic and not cool but then i'm like well hold on i don't know cookie she might be into that like she might think that's kind of this might be like foreplay for them you know um if snapping your fingers and saying right here is foreplay for cookie then wagging animal crackers in front of teddy's face is foreplay for teddy so it was just really unfortunate that she was caught without animal crackers in that moment i'm okay with that i don't know exactly like what what it is that their dynamic is but there's something weird going on here with the, between the animal crackers and her just being allowed to freely fool around with whoever and the snapping the fingers and like all of that they have a very not contemporary relationship and i'm, I'm okay with it i'm not i'm not mad it just at first glance i'm like ah oh, he's being terrible to her or she's being terrible to him but honestly this could be all part of the game they're just kind of terrible to each other and they they expect that and they like it it seems like maybe like it seems like there might be like a conversation they have behind closed doors where she's just like yeah i uh i like it when you like take charge and you're a big strong man and you like go after these guys that like you think are flirting with me or i'm flirting with them or whatever and he's like yeah and i like that you go around doing all that and uh gives me an excuse to yell at people i like yeah, that yeah let's uh let's make that like our whole dynamic actually and every time we see her like committing adultery she's actually actually doing exactly what the guy wants like teddy's like oh thank you yes now i can go and rough up this calamari guy after the movie's over and we can we can do the whole run around all over again you know <laughs> I need a purpose in my life, and my purpose is being angry at whoever you seduce. I love seducing people, so this works for me. Match made in heaven, Teddy. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, good for them. Good for them, man. Right on, right on. Well, well, we'll go ahead and call that an episode. That's the end of this episode. Thanks for having one crazy episode to see for yourself this summer. Ooh, I like this. Keep talking, keep talking.